So I'll just, um, it will be divided into two parts. The first part, I'll just uh, show you a bit about what I've written before uh, about uh, how the government has been taking our money to use, but then they have uh, changed and deleted the information so that it gives you a sign that the government actually knows, but it does not want to be transparent to Singaporeans. Um, the second part will be just uh, on some charts to uh, pretty much round out um, actually what, whatever the other presenters have already said. So uh, not something too new. Um, so are Singaporeans uh, CPF invested in the reserves? So obviously it is, uh, now we know. But like Leong Si had said before, over the past 10 to 15 or even 20 years, we actually do not know where the reserves were going. So that was why uh, when I started writing in 2012, I wanted to know because there were many rumours. So I, I then went to several government websites. I could not find the information on one single website that the CPF was invested in the reserves and then in the GIC and Tamasic Holdings. So I had to go to four different websites before I found the information. So about to just backtrack a bit, in 20. 2001, um, Lee Kuan Yew ever said that the GIC, he said that I want to clarify that there is no direct link between the GIC and the CPF. So he says that uh, GIC was, uh, they, they are separate. So the CPF board invests in Singapore government bonds and um, it's separate from the GIC. So that's what he said in 2001. In 2006, he also said again, um, let me add that there's no connection between GIC's rate of return and the interest paid on CPF accounts. So in 2006, he said that again. Um, in 2007, uh, Lothia Kiang asked, does the Government Investment Corporation GIC use money derived from CPF to invest? So whether directly or indirectly, uh, Ng Eng Hen at that time said the answer is no. So this has been going on since at least 2001, um, at which point the government stopped telling us we do not know. So what is the truth? I had to go to four different websites to find out the information. Um, these are all government websites. I found out that the CPF monies are invested in bonds. So the, these bonds are SSGS, which are then invested, um, which are then invest, borrowed by the government and invested. They are then invested in the reserves. The reserves are managed by three agencies, GIC, MAS, and Tomasic Holdings, which uh, Chris Kwan pretty much told you. But what happened after that was, uh, after I wrote this article, and actually after I got sued, I went back to look for the information again because I wanted to uh, check back on the information. I realized that there were some changes in the information. Um, yeah. So the government actually removed, this is a PDF document. I went back, I couldn't find the link. So the whole document was removed and replaced uh, by another link. And the change that the government made was they removed the word in reserves in reserves. So it just said all the proceeds from the government borrowings must therefore be invested, full stop. Before that, it says in reserves. What this therefore mean was that um, before that, we could know that the CPF will invest in bonds, which are then invested in reserves. Now there's a cut from it. So you would find it difficult to actually know the um, CPF is invested in the reserves. The second change that was made was previously, it's on the same uh, website. The website says that reserves are managed by three agencies. Thereafter, the government changed the information to say that the government assets are mainly managed by GIC. The government also placed deposits with MAS, um, and uh, the government is a sole equity shareholder of Tomasi Holdings. So, so it's difficult for you to actually know that the reserves are managed by GIC, Tomasi, and MAS. So this was another change they made. Um, I'll show you that there were a lot of other changes they made as well. <laughs> so it was, again, it was only after, um, I mean, it's not directly linked to me being sued, but it was only after <laughs> that the government for the first time actually revealed that the CPF is invested in SSGS, which are then invested in um, GIC. So that was the first time in 15, 10, 15, or even 20 years that Singaporeans know for the first time with proof from the government. So they admitted for the first time that the um, uh, CPF is invested in GIC for the first time. But the government still denied that Tamasing uh, manages the CPF. So is that true? In fact, on the Tomasic's website, it also says that Tomasic does not manage CPF savings. But if you look at this book written by Linda Lowe, who's, uh, who previously worked at the Ministry of Finance, she ever said once that um, CPF reserves are commingled with other investment uh, such as Tomasic Holdings. So is the CPF invested in the Tomasic Holdings?
Deputy um, Prime Minister and Finance Minister also said last year when I asked him, is the, the CPF invested in Tomasic Holdings at any one point in time? Uh, he said that uh, no, because Tomas uh, Tomasic Holdings started with a set of assets which were transferred uh, by the government to Tomasic. Um, but if you look at what Ong Teng Cheong said in 1982, he said that CPF savings form a large portion of uh, Singapore savings. These savings were used for capital formation, for construction of new factories, installation of new plants, equipment, infrastructure, roads, ports, telecommunications. Most of this eventually went to Tomasic, uh, Tomasic Holdings, right? So in that sense, uh, did Tomasic uh, invest in, uh, use the CPF to invest? <laughs> so um, pretty much there is some connection there. The thing is, even if the Tomasic Holdings does not use the CPF now, there needs to be some accountability from the government as to if it did in 1974, and at certain points in time, if it also got CPF funds, it has to be transparent to Singaporeans. Just a blanket statement to say that Tomasic Holdings does not invest CPF is not the complete truth. Yeah. In, but also, if you look at this other book, um, Reforming Corporate Governance in Southeast Asia, it says that in April 2004, constitutional amendment allowed the government to transfer reserves to key statutory boards, which also include Tomasic Holdings. The reserves also include uh, our CPF as well. So does this mean that uh, Tomasic Holdings therefore also get access to our reserves even now? Because what the government is saying is that they do not know if uh, they mix up the CPF with other funds, and then when it gets confused, they then pass it to GIC or Tomasic and uh, GIC or MES, and they do not know exactly where the money is going. If that's the case, does that mean our CPF also goes into Tomasic Holdings? There are some other changes that the government, um, there are some contradictions again in what the government says. The government also said that the government plays no role, this is uh, well known by now, the government says that it plays no role in decisions on individual investments that are made by GIC, MES, Tomasic. The GIC says that um, it, the government neither directs or interfere in the company's investment decisions. However, if you look at the board of directors on the GIC, um, and, then, and then if you look at the um, government itself, uh, in fact, the board of directors on the GIC includes uh, Raymond Lim, uh, ex-transport minister, as well as Dana Balan, also an ex-minister. The president, uh, Tony Tan, was a board member on GIC as well, and he's supposed to take care of our reserves at this point. <laughs> so whether there's a conflict of interest or not, um, that's a question that we need to ask. Um, now, the, what the GIC says, uh, it says that um, it manages, what it says now is that uh, where are the GIC's source of funds? Uh, the GIC says that it receives funds from the government without regard to the sources. So it does not know, but this is what it says now. Because if you trace what the GIC said in the past, it said that uh, sustained balance of payments, surpluses, and accumulated national savings are the fundamental source of the Singapore's government's funds. And the GICs manage uh, these financial assets from the government. So the GIC knew in the past that it manages the government's funds, which came from our sustained balance of payments and national savings, which are also our CPF. So if the, if the GIC knew in the past, why did they change the information thereafter? Yeah. So the question again is, in the past, the GIC also said that um, it manages, um, the short, I, short answer is that GIC manages the government's reserves. But as to how the funds from CPF monies flow into reserves, which could then be managed by GIC, it is not made explicit to us. So after the GIC, um, after, after May last year, when the government then admitted that the GIC does manage the CPF funds, they then changed the statement now to say, um, GIC, along with MAS, manages the SSGS, the bonds, and uh, which are issued and guaranteed by the government CPF board. So pretty much uh, the CPF monies. So while the CPF monies are not directly transferred to GIC, one of the sources could be from the SSGS, which is the CPF. So previously, the GIC said it's not made explicit to us. We do not know. Thereafter, they changed the information to say, yes, the CPF could be invested by us, but we are not sure. But, but there's an admission in that, in that sense. So you can see that there's a lot of um, changes in the information uh, that the government has been saying. Finally, uh, in this point, uh, the, the GIC also said that the government does not specify whether the assets are, um, 
uh, sorry, the government does not specify the sources of the assets that are placed with it. So the, again, uh, JIC said that it does not know if it's managing a CPF. But if you look at the government website again, it says very specifically, G CPF monies are invested by the CPF board in SSGS. And then um, the, the securities are, okay, the securities are first deposited with MAS, which are then converted. The main point here is that, um, the main point here is that long-term government liabilities like SSGS, so SSGS is long-term government liability, are then assets, they are transferred to GIC to be managed. This was what I found on the government website before they changed the information. So now this information has been changed too. What I'm trying to show you here is that uh, there have been many times that I took screenshots from the government websites. So initially I was able to trace how the CPF was then invested in the bonds and then in the reserves and the GIC and Tomasic Holdings, etc. But the government then changed the information across the board. After that, I was able to look at GIC and gov the government's website to also trace information that the bonds were invested in the GIC and that the GIC would know about the information was changed to make it look like the GIC doesn't know. When it was exposed that the GIC would know, the GIC then changed the information to make it look like they would know, but they're not sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, this is not to say that the government is trying to do anything funny. <laughs> Right from the start in 2001, is it right to say that the GIC does not manage the CPF? In fact, uh, it was known even in 1986 when Professor Lim Chong Yia uh, did a CPF study and he said that this uh, CPF uh, is invested by the GIC. So at which point in time was the information, did the information become missing from Singaporeans? And at which point in time did the government then decided that it does not need to be as transparent to Singaporeans? And if so, what for? So this is a question we need, to, we need to ask. But of course, we are not able to answer if we do not have access to the government's funds. And we do not have access if we are not in the government. <laughs> Why is the CPF so important? It's not just because it's the CPF. It affects everyone. It affects housing, healthcare, education, and retirement. So it affects everyone, and that's why the CPF is so important. I think I will move on. Oh, yeah. So um, actually... Just now, um, Chris, uh, Chris Kwan gave us a very simple understanding and uh, me a very understanding of how much uh, assets we would have in government. But when President Ong Teng Chong asked in the past, they told him that he said that it would, the, gov the PAP told him it would take three years to give it to him. And uh, later they told him that it would take 56 man years to produce a dollar and cents value of the immovable assets. And then he said that finally they made a compromise. Uh, we do not need um, dollars and, and cents values. Just give me a listing of all properties. And even then, it, only, it took them a few months to produce a list. So why <laughs> Uh, in all fairness, actually, uh, the difficulty in estimating the reserves is uh, how do you estimate the land holding? So the question then again is, the government should know. Um, if the problem now is that the CPF is invested in the GIC and some parts of it would have been invested in Tomasic Holdings, but we do not have transparent information because both uh, Tomasic Holdings and GIC said that we are private limited companies and we, can, we do not need to share all my financial information with you. But even Tomasic Holdings said at one point that Tomasic Holdings assets belong to Singaporeans. If the assets belong to Singaporeans and GIC manages our CPF, then there is... The government cannot say that because we are private limited, we cannot tell them the money. Yeah. It is our money. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So if you don't account to us, who do you account to? Malaysia. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Lee Kuan Yew, at least he long ever said at one point that uh, he does not believe transparency is, is everything. Okay, if transparency is not everything, then you can manage a company which is not using our money, which is using your money, and our CPF will be managed by ourselves. <laughs> yeah. so, so that's the problem, <laughs> uh, basic problem. I'll um, go very quickly into the stats because um, Leung Zihian showed just now that um, Taman uh, mentioned yesterday that if you look at the social protection that the government gives back in terms of how much we pay in tax, it's actually higher. But we need to account for the fact that we're also paying indirect tax as well as the CPF. Um, one thing one thing the government in Singapore likes to do is to say that the CPF is not a tax. It also says that the CPF is your own money, or maybe not your money, um, and, and therefore it should not be included in tax. However, 
the CPF can be used for um, healthcare, education, uh, housing, etc. So I don't think we need to, uh, we should not uh, separate it. For me, the just if you look at, say, uh, the Nordic countries, whatever they collect in tax is given back in terms of health, uh, healthcare, uh, retirement, etc. So if you just look at what is collected and what is given back, uh, for me, fundamentally, the CPF and tax should be included in comparison. Yeah. So if you look at personal income tax, Singaporeans are paying one of the lowest income tax uh, among the developed countries. But if you look at how much we pay into CPF and indirect tax as compared to personal income tax, we actually pay nearly eight times more than the other countries, which means that the government is collecting, the government uh, likes to use the phrase uh, income tax as low. Oh, sorry, the uh, statistics I got are from uh, Eurostats uh, for the European countries. Um, they make it quite clear what the uh, direct uh, personal income tax uh, and in, uh, indirect tax as well as social security is, so it's quite easy to uh, calculate. So the government likes to say that um, personal income tax is low in Singapore and therefore Singaporeans have to be thankful. And because personal income tax is low, we cannot give you back the money because we do not collect enough money. <laughs> but of course that is not true because they collect a lot of CPF as well as indirect tax from Singaporeans. So if you look at how much the government gives back in terms of social protection as a percentage of the total tax and social security that they collect, Singapore actually gives back the least out of the total tax, uh, personal income tax, indirect tax as well as uh, CPF that they collect as compared to the other countries. And if you include this, um, the estimated um, 20 to 30 billion that's not given back to Singaporeans every year is even lower, the, that the government does not declare. So if you look at the social protection expenditure as a percentage of GDP, Singapore also spends the lowest. And if you look at how much the government gets to save as compared to how much they actually um, uh, spend, the Singapore government saves the most among the developed countries, which means that the government actually collects a lot of income tax, personal income tax, indirect tax, and CPF, and it gives back very little, such that it can save a lot of surplus. Yeah. Which is why a lot of Singaporeans, more and more Singaporeans, are uh, languishing into poverty. Um, so, so sh but the problem now is Singaporeans are paying uh, at that time 37%, but now 38% into our CPF, which means that if we are paying so much into CPF, like what Leung Zihian calculated, Singaporeans should have as much as $3 million, $3 million uh, when we retire. But why is this not happening? The, one of the reasons is because uh, interest rates, um, based on one of Leung Suhian's article, is the lowest in the world, or one of the lowest in the world. And therefore, we are not able to earn the real returns on our CPF. The, another thing is because um, the government, this is an estimate, of course, 3% uh, is what we would get back on our CPF. But, uh, um, Chris Kwan just estimated that it could be 3.7%. So we do not have a specific figure because the government does not uh, review. And how much does the GIC make? Uh, Chris Kwan just estimated it's about 5.7%. So the government has also not reviewed. So this is just an estimate to show that if based on the tr uh, average 3% interest on our CPF, we would, for someone who would be um, earning, oh, I forgot what's my base estimate, but okay. A person who uh, assumingly would, after 30 years, uh, earn $300,000, if the interest was returned, they would actually get back $450,000, which means that it's as much as half of our CPF that we would be losing just by using these uh, um, uh, figures and estimates. So if we only have proper uh, figures from the government, we will make a better uh, estimate. Or Chris Kwan would actually do a better estimate after this. <laughs> yeah. So. I want to quickly go into the question uh, whether the CPF is your money. If you look at in 20, uh, 2013, we've already paid nearly 60 billion into our uh, Medisafe at that point in time. But in 2013 itself, we were only able to withdraw 768 million, which is less than 1.5% of what we've paid. Which means that there's more than 98% of the Medisafe that the government uses as surplus. Where, where does the money go again? This is a lot of money, more than 98%. Because if you calculate that if we just increase the um, spending in Medisafe itself to uh, perhaps 10%, it would uh, enable Singaporeans to be protected by even 80% of government expenditure. Because right now the government is only spending 30% of uh, total health expenditure. If we just increase it to this to 10%, we would very easily be able to cover up to even 70, 80%. So why is the government not doing it? Also, when you look at uh, when Medisafe was introduced in 1984, after Medisafe, before Medisafe was introduced, um, 
health subsidies would cover for 50%. But gradually, after Medisafe was introduced, the government made us pay more and more from our Medisafe, but it started reducing health subsidies. So much so that it went from 50% to now, um, at that point in time, about 30%. I think now it has gone back to about 40%. But you can see that the government actually got Singaporeans to pay more into Medisafe, but then reduced the subsidies. If that's, and now that we know that the government is um, paying us so, back, so little back from Medisafe, but the health subsidies are so low, where are Singaporeans going to get the money to pay for the rest of the expenditure out from our own pockets? <laughs> Cash. Um, and the problem, I think I have a chart later to show you. Um, the problem is when we pay cash, we actually pay one of the highest, in fact, the second highest after Switzerland in the world. So we pay the most out of our own pocket per capita in the world after Switzerland. Problem is, Singaporeans also earn relatively low wages as compared to the other developed countries, which means that our purchasing power is a lot reduced because with the much lesser wages that we have, we have to pay even more for healthcare so that we have uh, much lesser to save. If you look at minimum wage in Switzerland, it's $3,000 um, or so. Um, Singapore, there's no minimum wage, but uh, cleaners earn about $1,000. How are cleaners then supposed to get the kind of money to um, pay for healthcare expenditure, which explains why many Singaporeans have chosen to actually, yeah, and news reports have shown that some Singaporeans have chosen to die instead of actually go to the hospital. Okay, what I'm not comfortable with, the, because there's a MediShield, MediSafe and MediFund. So if you're low-income Singaporeans, you get MediFund. When I was uh, working in uh, HIV programs, I had to call up patients to find out why they were not coming back. So there were feedback from patients that said that you want me to submit all my uh, income statements and not only my income statements, my family income statements. Uh, how am I going to get the information? And it, it's a very tedious process. And it's not just that. Every time I apply, I have to submit. And I have to apply every few months. Some people are very deterred. Uh, first thing is, if I have HIV, and you want me to get my income statements from my other family members, what if my family members find out? So some of them choose to drop out because they first, they do not want to uh, stand the shame and embarrassment, and second, because it is a very tedious process. And the process itself forces people to fall out of the system and not, not want to get health subsidies. This money is there, but I've, I've also had a patient, she's, uh, she said that her mom has cancer, she has HIV. So uh, she's a low-income worker taking on several jobs. At one point she said, you know, I'll just forgo my medication. My mom has cancer, I need to take care of my mom, I need money for my mom. So she needs to apply for Medifund for her mom. <laughs> and then she needs to apply for Medifund for herself. It's a very complicated process. Um, the, the government can now, um, recently the government has done an exercise. So it says that we are going to get everyone to submit your income statements so that we know how much we can pay you for your MediShield premium subsidies. So if the government can get that kind of information so that they can then know how much they can pay you for the subsidies, why can't they then use that information to ensure that if you are a low-income person, you will get MediFund automatically? <laughs> because if you do not pay your MediShield Medi premium, the government says it can fine you, it can jail you. So when it comes to collecting money and when it comes to penalizing Singaporeans, I can make it very automatic. But when it comes to helping you, it's very difficult to make it automatic. <laughs> but, but we are a very rich country, so there's no reason why Singapore cannot have the automated system to ensure that we protect our poor. Okay. So when you look at MediShield, again, um, from 20, 20, 2001 to 2010, the government has collected about 850 uh, million in surplus in MediShield, but in 2011 we were only able to use 282 million, which is only a quarter of what we have. And this is not including a MediShield surplus that uh, is accumulated from 1987, 1990 to 2000. So um, that amount is not uh, transparent and publicly known. So if that's included, then we would have been spending less than a, qu a quarter or much lesser. So again, I mean, <laughs> where is the money going? Um, Chris Kwan touched on uh, prices. This is uh, information that I got from uh, public uh, media sources. In 1981 to 1988, uh, land flat prices increased by only 2.5%. But from 1988 to 1992, it increased by 12%. This was because in 1987, um, the government decided to include land costs into the flat prices, which drove up the prices as well. Um, in, uh, it also is because of how the government uh, opened up the CPF to allow it to be used for a resale flats in 1994 that then caused it to spurt again later. 
And if you look at prices from 2008 to 2013, I think, land costs went up by 18.2%, resale flat prices by 9%, but incomes only 5.3%. So again, back to the same question, if wages are not increasing as fast, interest rates on the CPF are not increasing as fast, but housing prices are increasing so much faster, it means that our CPF will be depleted much faster and the real value of our CPF goes down. That is why Singaporeans are not able to retire, a lot of Singaporeans are not able to retire today because our wages didn't catch up fast enough, but prices went up to, uh, for the housing went up too fast. In fact, Kobung Wan said in Parliament last year, uh, we control the construction program. We we also decide um, on the prices for the HDB flats. In that sense, the government therefore has control over how much they can charge. If that's the case, if the government knows that wages are, have been depressed for the past 10 to 20 years, but prices are going up too fast, why does the government not do anything to mediate the situation to ensure that Singaporeans will not lose our CPF? Yeah, I mean, it's estimated that land cost actually makes up 60% of the HDB flat prices, which Again, uh, some of the people in the audience said that the land is, doesn't actually belong to Singaporeans anymore and the government gets it quite cheaply. So why are we paying for the land cost? It's, I mean, for, for me, it's not a problem to pay for the land cost if you increase my wages, if you increase my interest rates, so that my CPF grows. If you have done a calculation in the long term to say that by increasing your CPF interest rates, by increasing your wages, and also when housing prices increase, whatever you pay will still ensure that you get a home and you're still able to retire, then okay, the contract is maintained. But if you depress the wages, depress the CPF interest rates, and you increase HDB flat prices, so much so that we cannot retire and we cannot even pay for the flat, the contract is broken, then why are we sacrificing our money to help you grow the reserves when we cannot even protect ourselves? Oh. Yeah. I mean, the, the system works in Singapore for the first 20 years or so was because even though interest rates uh, HDB flat prices were go going up, but so were wages, so were interest rates. We were therefore in a contract that was relatively comfortable where we know that we are still protected. But the system from 1980s, 1990s onwards got distorted. So the CPF minimum sum also had sharp increases over the... In fact, in some years, in increased by as much as 10%. So if wages never increased by as much, but um, CPF minimum sum increased by even higher, how? The question is, the government says, I want to increase your CPF minimum sum because I, w I want to ensure that you have this amount inside your CPF so that you can retire on. Okay, very nice. You help me to increase the CPF minimum sum, but if you don't help me to increase my CPF, there's no way I can ever reach the CPF minimum sum, which means it's useless. <laughs> Because what the government should do is the government should say, if this is how much you should be having inside your CPF minimum sum, I will make sure that I know how much interest rates your CPF should go, how much your wages should go, and therefore a minimum wage, so that you will be able to meet that. Yeah. So, yeah, common, common sense. So if the government is only willing to implement a CPF minimum sum without actually doing anything else to in increase the CPF, Either the government does not know its calculations or the government does not want to help Singaporeans. Yeah. Yeah. I don't believe the government does not know its calculations. Uh. <laughs> yeah. So it's estimated by uh, Leong Sihen that as much as 85% or nearly 90% of Singaporeans are not able to meet the CPF minimum sum. Up to this point, the Singapore government's PAP still does not want to let Singaporeans know how, with, uh, for all Singaporeans, how many of us cannot meet the CPF minimum sum. Tan Chuan Jin said last year that he would try to look into it. It has never happened. <laughs> this, this is uh, just my own... In short, what I'm trying to say here is that... Um, should I go into this? Okay, in short, what I'm trying to say is that, that we have our ordinary account, special account, MediSafe. If you look at our ordinary account, Tan Chuan Jin said that 55% of it goes into flats, um, uh, uh, housing mortgages. Out of the housing mortgages, of course, 60% will go into um, the, uh, the land cost, right? And because the land doesn't belong to us, that, that money is essentially not ours in that sense. And if you look at MediSafe, we pay, of the MediSafe money that we pay, we only get back about less than, less than um, uh, maybe about 10% of the MediSafe that we pay every year back. So in that sense, about 90% or so is actually surplus that the government takes. So in that sense, there's actually this amount of money that goes into land costs and surplus that the money takes, uh, the government takes that is not returned to us. So I estimate that there might be about 20% that's still left for us. 
Well, like, I, like Chris Kwan was mentioning just now, there's an uh, implicit tax component because the government only gives us an estimated 3 to 3.7% in interest for our CPF, but it takes another sum of money. And this money that's not returned to us, by, for some economists, this is an implicit tax we are paying. Based on my calculation, this amount of money that the government does not give back to us is actually an additional 20% of our wages on top of the CPF. So for me, I would include it, I would include it as part of for me, I will include it as part of. So we actually pay about 37%, 38% in interest, uh, CPF, and then there's another 20% that is an implicit tax that we don't get back, which I think we therefore are sacrificing in wages. And so if you look at how much this 20% that we have supposedly have in our CPF, it's actually money that's also taken away. Okay, what, what I'm trying to say here is that the CPF is not your money. Because if... <laughs> I mean, but this is my calculations because there are many ways I think um, uh, Chris Kwan might want to um, look at it a, a bit better. So it, when the government says that the CPF is your money, is it really your money? When a lot of the money actually goes into land costs and Medisave surplus, which does not go back to you. If the government is transparent, if it says this is your money, this is how I'm taking it, I'm transparently telling you that this is how much you pay into your housing, transparently telling you how much you pay into Medisave, how much I take as surplus, and then we look at it as a whole and we say, okay, this is an arrangement I can agree with, I will accept. If not, then we will say, actually, I think you're taking too much into land costs, too much into Medisave surplus, I don't agree with you. This is a democratic decision that we have to make because we are citizens who own the money. So if the government tells us that I think that you do not know how to manage your money and therefore I will control it and I will not tell you because you might not know, then it's, <laughs> then, you know, then, then it's very irresponsible because not only that, like I showed you just now, a lot of the CPF money actually goes into GIC, Tomasi Holdings, and it's not known. So when we are therefore not able to retire because our CPF is not enough and the government actually earns quite a huge profit out from GIC and Tomasi Holdings, then there is a problem there. Is the government's allegiance to Singaporeans or is the government's allegiance to the investment firms that they own, which they do not want to be transparent to us? So obviously the allegiance... <laughs> the allegiance should be to Singaporeans. Yeah. Okay, I'll quickly wrap up with uh, just some round off. Um, a survey done last year showed that more than half of Singaporeans actually felt the CPF is unfair because the interest rates are too low. Um, the problem actually started in 1981 when uh, GIC was set up. Uh, it was actually set up with uh, Rothschild's involvement. Uh, it's, uh, what I read uh, based on a um, book um, that uh, detailed how GIC was set up, at that time Lee Kuan Yew told Go King Sui to set up the GIC. Uh, so, sorry, uh, Lee Kuan Yew told GIC to come into MES to manage MES. And uh, Go King Sui then asked several um, officials from uh, MINDEF, uh, the Ministry of Defense, to then do a study uh, inside uh, MES. There, he found that um, there were some um, procedures in MES that were not uh, strong enough. But at that time, there were critics that uh, this is, some people felt that this criticism is unfair. However, uh, Go King Sui then went to set up GIC um, to mediate the situation. But there were some people who were sacked from MES at that time or who were fired who then eventually joined GIC. So there is a, there's a bit of com complexity in how, um, what happened at that point. It's also a coincidence that in 1982, in 1954, the PAP's constitution said that it wanted to abolish, abolish the unjust inequalities of wealth. So it wanted to um, have more equality for Singaporeans. But in 1982, this was removed. And the PAP then um, went on to say that it wanted Singaporeans to be self-reliant. <laughs> so, so that was uh, a start. Um, and the problems, I'll quickly go through it. Uh, the problems were actually known by the MPs at the time, by the old guards, by the... MPs who actually cared for Singaporeans. So Tochin Chai said at the time that the CP CPF has lost its credibility and management. In fact, from 1986, the, the government, PAP, wanted to peg the CPF interest rates to bank interest rates because at that time, the critique was that the interest rates were not high enough. And if it was pegged to the bank's interest rates, perhaps the interest rates would then go up. Well, ever since it was pegged to the bank's interest rates, it has never gone up. <laughs> In fact, by 1999, it, went, it was depressed to 2.5% uh, to 4%. At that time, in the university fees as well, in 1986 to 1988, it increased by as much as 454%. Then in 1989, that was when the government then said, you can use your CPF to pay for university fees. <laughs> uh, CPF minimum sum was um, 
created in 1987, and uh, Chum Si Tong has, at that point said the government has no business to hold back our money. So what I'm trying to show you here is that these problems were actually known, but because there were not enough MPs in government, of course none of these were known to Singaporeans, of course because the media is controlled as well, it is also not possible for us to know that these are the long-term problems that can happen to Singapore. In, in the 1980s, some of the MPs realized this problem, but we do not have the statistics, and we are only starting to feel the effects of the MediSafe, of the MediShare, and the CPM minimum sum on our life right now. So, but you will need to know that the seeds were actually planted as far back as the 1980s. So it has been ongoing for the past 30 years or so. Okay, um, so last few slides. This is to show, so what I'm, the background now is that the CPF is supposed to pay for your housing, retirement, healthcare, education, etc. But even from the CPF itself, we are not able to use enough for healthcare. We have to pay too much for housing. For retirement, we are not able to have adequate to use. If so, does it mean that the government should then have a responsibility to top up from the other side? So if you're collecting income tax and indirect tax from us, and if we are not able to use enough from our CPF, can you then pay additional to support us? So for example, if we cannot have enough for our retirement inside the CPF, should you as a government then put in the uh, parallel public pension scheme to ensure that the elderly would not need to uh, work until some of them have to um, you know, die? <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> or cardboard collectors want to have dignity and therefore they collect cardboard co cardboards. <laughs> so the question is, the government has a responsibility to do that. But the Singapore government actually spends the lowest, one of the lowest uh, in the, among developed countries for social protection. This is not including healthcare and education because otherwise it would drive it uh, down a lot more. The government also spends uh, the lowest as a percentage of GDP on healthcare. This was based on 2011. I do not have the latest statistics. I think it will go up to about 35 or so at this point, but it's still the lowest among developed countries. The government then makes Singaporeans pay the second highest amount of developed countries per capita for our healthcare. This is uh, from World Health Organization, which means, uh, like I said just now, our wages are relatively much lower than other developed countries, but we are paying a lot higher out of pocket for healthcare. Education, the government spends the lowest among developed countries as a percentage of GDP for education, but we are made to pay one of the highest uh, university fees. Uh, this is not complete because uh, the um, PISA, PISA report that I took does not include all countries, but it will still be one of the highest that citizens have to pay for uh, university fees. But if you look at how much, like uh, Mr. Tanji said, uh, the government actually pays uh, 400 million for foreign students to study in Singapore, but Singaporeans have to pay 1 billion. This means that the government has enough to subsidize Singaporeans even by half. So why is this not happening? And which is why I think SingFirst has proposed you know, to uh, increase education expenditure, healthcare expenditure, to therefore allow Singaporeans to be more protected. So again, housing, this is housing prices for not just uh, for, for private properties, uh, one of the most expensive, and public housing, like Leung Sihian said, is the most expensive. Um, and then if you look at public pension scheme, Singapore does not. Actually, the government just uh, announced a public pension scheme for only people who are 65 and above, and every three months, we will pay you, I think they will pay you about 400 on average. So you get back about $100 or, or so every month. This is not a public pension scheme. <laughs> if you want a public pension scheme, what the government should do is it should calculate. And the government has. It says that based on your CPF minimum sum, I will want you to have 106, last year it was 151000 so that every month you can get back $1,200, so that you can then have a standard of living that's um, as good as a, sec a lower middle income Singaporean. If so, the government knows that $1,200 is what it should give back to Singaporeans. So why is this public pension scheme that is giving back only giving back about $100 a month every... <laughs> and not only that, when you want to get back your money from the CPF, some of the people actually get back only a few hundred dollars. Um, I mean, we've spoken to some low-income families and they get back 200 And then on top of this, you get back $300. That means there's another $900 that the government says you should have that you don't. If that's, and this explains why the public pension in, uh, expenditure by the government in Singapore is also one of the lowest in the world, uh, among the developed countries. And again, I think SingFirst also has a plan to introduce a, a parallel public pension scheme to protect Singaporeans. I'm not sure how much it is. 
Yeah. But this is, I mean, this is really looking at, because right now we are really looking at how much we need to ensure that Singaporeans, how much money we have as a budget, how much, if the government, if a new government comes in, how much do they want to put in as a minimum and then gradually grow it so that we can manage the budget and we, we can ensure that we are able to ensure we do not overshoot. So the problem now is there's no transparency. So we do not know, we know there's the money, we know that we can sustain this social protection for Singaporeans, but how much? We do not have the full information. And once we have, at least we can then transparently tell Singaporeans, this is how much we have, how much we want to give back. Do you agree? And then we'll do it because it's, it's a responsibility to Singaporeans. Yeah. So uh, again, Singapore has one of the lowest interest rates among the, um, uh, actually in the world for the CPF. So based on the OECD uh, report, Singapore has one of the least adequate um, retirement funds among the OECD and Asia Pacific countries. So among most of the European countries and Asia, Asian countries, uh, that was in 2013. Okay? But the GIC and Tamase Holdings, uh, the last I checked, still has, uh, are one of the richest sovereign wealth funds in the world. It has dropped a bit actually. But the question is why, is, why are Singaporeans earning one of the least adequate retirement funds, but the GIC and Tamasi Holdings taking so much of the returns that we should be getting back and becoming so rich? So again, the question is, what is the allegiance that the government should have for Singaporeans, and why is this not happening? Yeah. So uh, what I'm trying to show you, okay, just to wrap up, because that's all. <laughs> the CPF is not your money. Uh, who is it reserved for? I do not know. <laughs> what, what do you say? <laughs> Oh, okay. Uh, I do not know. Um, so what I'm trying to show you is that there, you can see that we, we, now we know where the government is, uh, where the money that the CPF is going, where our reserves are going and how it's being managed. But there, there was many changes in the past that prevented us from knowing. And when you look at how much uh, we are therefore getting back from our CPF, we realize that we cannot save enough to retire because housing prices are too high, interest rates are too low, wages are not growing. And then if that's so, there is a responsibility for the government to return that money via taxes. But that's not happening as well because the government spends one of the lowest. If so, what does the government, what does PAP expect Singaporeans to eat on? <laughs> so CPF you take, you earn. Taxes you take, you earn. Then what else do we take? Eat our own bones. Huh? <laughs> so I mean, the, the, at the end of the day, I think what we need to know is the government has to be transparent and accountable to Singaporeans. Our CPF is our money. If you want to manage it, we have a responsibility and we have a right to tell you how you want to manage it. It's not up to you to decide that you do not want to be transparent. If you do not want to be, don't take our money. <laughs>